the Jerome Foundation's Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship webinar. Today, we will be focusing on the fellowship application. And thanks so much for joining us. And just to note that your line is muted, but to ask questions, click the chat button in your menu bar. You can also click the live transcript option to have closed captioning. And this is done by a computer, so there might be some strange translations in the transcription, but a corrected closed caption will be there when we record and post this recording to our events page on the Jerome Foundation website. And we currently have the fellowship overview webinar. If you missed that, that's available to view on our events page as well. We're joining you today from Minnesota Makoche, also called Minnesota. It's the homeland of the Dakota peoples. Today, there are 11 tribes, including four Dakota and seven Anishinaabe. And at Jerome, we want to honor and respect the tribal sovereignty, rights, and cultural resilience of the many native and indigenous peoples that can, are connected to this land, uh, as well as the lands of the Lenape, Munsee, and Canarsi, and many other tribes in what is today called New York City, uh, where we also fund. I'm Eleanor Savage. I'm the program director at Jerome Foundation. Uh, I am pronoun flexible. And uh, for a visual description, uh, I am wearing a, a kind of dark orange sweater with a, a blue shirt underneath because it's very, very cold here in Minnesota today. I have uh, white skin from uh, Scots Irish descent, short cropped hair, black glasses. I'm in a yellow room with white framed doors and uh, there's a couple of paintings behind me. And I'll pass it to Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Brown. I'm the Grants and Program Administrator at the Jerome Foundation, she, her pronouns. And I, for a visual description, I have white skin, uh, European descent, uh, short, dark hair, black glasses. I'm wearing a gray sweater and I'm in my living room slash office with some bookshelves and books behind me, a reading chair, and I'm sitting next to a, at this moment, very cold window. And I'll pass it along to Melissa. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa Levin, and I am a program associate with the Jerome Foundation. My pronouns are she, her. And for a visual description, I am a white skinned woman. I have medium length, dark brown, wavy hair with some gray in it and bangs. Um, I'm wearing a white uh, sweater and um, I'm sitting in my home office. And on one side of me, I have a bookshelf that is filled with colorful books and cascading plants and other objects and ephemera. And on the other side, I have um, a light pink wall behind me with some framed artwork and postcards. And I will pass to Laura. Hello, my name is Laura Mimosa Montez. I'm a program associate here at the Jerome Foundation, uh, pronouns she, her. For a visual description, I am a light-skinned Puerto Rican woman with curly cropped hair, much like a broccoli, seated in an office space with light walls and text-based uh, text artworks in the background. Great, and the rest of our small but mighty staff, our president Ben Cameron, you can see here on screen, as well as our finance team, Coretta Kendricks and Lori Lewan. We have an, about an hour, a little less than an hour now today, uh, and a, there's a lot of ground to cover, and we want to leave ample time for your uh, questions. So feel free to populate those in the chat as we go along. The goal of today's session is to provide information about different components of the application, give you some context around why we ask for this information, and we'll cover how to choose your field and which to apply. Um, We'll touch lightly on the eligibility quiz, uh, and uh, we'll also go into depth on the review criteria. We'll take a, a little bit of time with the review timeline, 
and how you can connect to Jerome staff throughout the application process. And we'll close with your questions. Uh, so I'm gonna hand off to Melissa to take us into the application guide. Great, thank you, Eleanor. Um, so you can find most of the information we are going to be covering today in the application guide, which is available as a PDF on our website on the Artist Fellowship page. And Andrea is going to drop the link into the chat for those of you who are interested either in following along or saving all of this information for later. The application guide is a great way for you to get a preview of all of the application components, questions, and requirements before you even log into Submittable, which is where you'll fill out your application. It's also helpful to note that this information is additionally available alongside the application in Submittable once you're in there. Um, and in Submittable, you'll also find help text for each section. Okay, uh, so before we go into that application, we want to remind you of some of the basics of the uh, fellowship program. Uh, the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship supports a diverse range of early career generative artists based in Minnesota or the five boroughs of New York City. The fellowship is a grant of $25,000 per year for two consecutive years, so that's a total of $50,000. This funding is flexible, so artists can decide for themselves their two-year plan and how to allocate those funds. And generally speaking, the funds can be used for the creation of and presentation of new work, artistic development, and or professional artistic career development. These funds support grantees to take creative risks, explore new ideas, and investigate professional and artistic activities. The foundation expects to award a total of 63 fellowships across eight fields, as you see here on the slide. Within each field, the foundation supports a wide range of aesthetics, forms, uh, creative practices and lineages and points of view. The foundation applauds experimentation and interdisciplinarity within each field. And the first step towards applying is making sure you're eligible. So I'll hand it off uh, to Laura momentarily to, to talk more about eligibility. But first I wanna uh, talk about that at, as you enter into the application process, we'll ask you to select the field in which you would like to be reviewed. Uh, considering which panel is best positioned to understand your current artistic practice, uh, your generative work and the work that you plan to pursue during your fellowship. So you'll find explanations of each of the fields in the application guide. And we ask you to consider your field selection not as a required box to check because we're not trying to shoehorn you into uh, a way that you, you don't feel represents you fully. Um, but we think of it as a way of signaling your artistic lineage and practice and having an idea of the general breadth of knowledge and experience of the panelists that are reviewing your, your work. We emphatically embrace creative risk-taking and all things experimental, innovative, hybrid, and interdisciplinary um, practice. And we work hard to make sure that the panels are prepared to understand work that fits solidly within a field and work that is pushing the boundaries in, in all sorts of fun, messy ways. And if you have questions about selecting a field for your practice, don't hesitate to contact us. We are here to you know, help you with your questions. And now to you, Laura. Great, thanks, Eleanor. So when you go into Submittable, you'll find a landing page with information about the fellowship. It looks like the image on the bottom left. Um, below that, you'll find links to the eight fields as seen in the middle screenshot. Once you select the field you want to apply in, you'll see the eligibility quiz pops up before letting you start the application. We start with a quiz to prevent artists who are not eligible from spending valuable time on the application. 
The quiz aligns with the eligibility criteria in the fellowship overview PDF. Andrea, would you mind dropping the link to the overview in the chat? We talked extensively about eligibility in the overview webinar and the recording of that is available on the Jerome Foundation's website. Andrea, would you mind sharing that link as well? Thank you. So if you are ineligible, you will not be able to proceed into the application. If your situation requires more discussion, then you'll be prompted at the end of the quiz to set up an eligibility phone call with Jerome Foundation program staff, along with a link to do so. Please note that you must have an eligibility call with Jerome program staff before April 15th, 2022. Note that the deadline for the application is May 4th. Um, so we really ask that you spend some time doing the eligibility quiz and looking at the overview guidelines um, before April 15th. Once you have determined you are eligible, you'll dive into the application. And Eleanor will speak a bit more generally about the review criteria. Yes, thanks, Laura. Um, so as you're moving through the application, we urge you to consider the review criteria that the panel will use uh, in assessing your application. Uh, so those are, there are three, artistic merit of your work, creative explorations and aspirations of you and your work, and engagement and or impact of you on your field and or your creative communities. The panel assesses these criteria based on your work samples, responses to the core questions, uh, as well as the, your history and evidence of support and recognition on your CV. Uh, we say that need is not a criteria. We have no way of, assess of assessing that. The panel will consider the alignment of all of the application elements. For example, whether the work samples and CV reflect the information shared in the core questions and uh, vice versa. And in reaching the final roster of fellows, the panels are charged to think not only of the ability of every finalist to meet each criterion strongly, but of recommending a cohort of fellows that collectively captures the energy and diversity of the field. Now, Melissa's gonna go into all of those components. Thanks, Eleanor. Mm -hmm. As you can see here, the application is made up of five components, and we will go into detail on each of these, but briefly, they are basic information, which includes how you describe your artistic practice, your work samples, which will be accompanied by additional contextual information, a detailed CV that establishes your eligibility, and the core questions, which invite you to share who you are, what you are working on and where you are directing your creative energies. And finally, we will ask for some basic demographic and contact information. There are also things that we don't ask for. So we recognize the time that is necessary to create an application. And with that in mind, we do not ask applicants to provide fellowship plans or budgets for the panel to consider. Only awarded fellows are asked for plans and budgets after they have been approved by the Jerome Foundation Board of Directors. We also do not ask for references or letters of recommendation. And now over to Lara for more on basic information. So at the top of the application, you will provide first your name. If you're applying as a collaborative, you'll include the names of everyone who's part of the application. And an FYI, we don't request a legal name in the application, just the common artist name you are known by is fine. We also ask for your pronouns, details about your residence, whether in the state of Minnesota or the five boroughs of New York City, and a detailed, uh, I'm sorry, a description of your practice in your own words. This is where you are asked to specify the genres, styles, aesthetics and forms that describe your work. You might notice that both the application guide and the submittable help text include in your own words work description examples from other artists, um, but we don't want you to feel limited by these suggestions. Uh, we just offer them as inspiration for you um, to be as expansive and or specific as you like when describing your practice. 
and I'll hand it back over to Eleanor to speak a bit more about the work samples. Great, thank you, Laura. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time here on work samples. Um, and the work samples will be used by the panel to assess the, your review criteria of artistic merit. And Jerome defines artistic merit um, as, as you can see here on the screen. So we look at whether the creative work is or has the potential to be compelling, offering distinctive vision and authentic voice, deeply considered and imaginative, executed with attention to craft and technical proficiency in the form, aesthetics, genre, et cetera, uh, effective and engaging in the use of structure and aesthetics, providing artistic experiences that communicate unique perspectives and invite viewers to question, discover, and explore new ideas in new ways. Uh, it's taking creative risks by expanding or questioning, experimenting with, or reimagining conventional artistic forms. We share this definition of merit because this is a word that has many different meanings, and we want to provide you, as well as the panelists, with a shared definition. As we previously mentioned, the panel will consider the alignment among the application elements. So uh, they'll be looking to see whether the, the, what they see in the work samples is uh, underscored in your answers to the core questions, for example. So moving uh, more specifically into the work samples, um, there, are, there are requirements that are specific to each field and these are noted in the application guide and in the submittable. And Jerome's options for work samples are nuanced because we're attempting to offer options that reflect the range of the ways that you're working. Uh, we're aware that this creates very detailed information, uh, especially for artists who are combining types of samples, but we prefer to be responsive and embrace nuance rather than having a kind of cookie cutter approach that simplifies things to the point where you're frustrated in not being able to represent yourself. Um, and we're here to help you if it's confusing. So uh, again, we're here, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So I wanna also review some of the information that applies to work samples for all fields. Um, the applicant must be the generative art artist for all submitted samples. So you have to have the rights to the work. If you're applying as an individual, you should not submit anything that you co-created with others. And if you're applying as collaborators, all of the work samples must be creative work generated by all of the collaborators applying. And you should submit work samples which you feel are your strongest examples of your practice uh, that demonstrate how you implement your creative ideas and explorations and give a sense of the kind of work that you hope to create in the future. So I'm happy to speak more about the types of work samples that are ineligible. So some work samples that aren't eligible would include promotional videos, trailers, reels, or interviews, work in which you are a performer, interpreter, translator, or dancer, but you didn't generate the work, commercial or non-commercial work for hire that you generated at the direction of a client, organization, or producer, even if it's a commission, um, for which you do not have primary creative control, again, in the instance that you don't have the rights to use it, and news or journalistic work are ineligible work samples for this fellowship. Melissa? Thanks, Laura. So I will talk about the work sample requirements. Um, we require two work samples from all applicants and both samples must be from a completed work or body of work. Um, those works may or may not have been presented publicly as long again as they are completed works. One potential difference to note between the two required work samples, if this applies to you, is that one of your work samples must be of a completed work or body of work not created and presented while enrolled in a degree granting program or with all student performers, 
while the second required work sample must be of a completed work or body of work and may be one that was created while in a degree granting program or with all student performers. So just to reiterate the distinction we're making is that one sample must be a completed work or body of work not created when the applicant was in a degree granting program or with all student per performers and the second may be one that was completed in a degree granting program. And we also want to note that um, the panels have uh, let us know that they have a preference for recent non student created and publicly presented work. So if you do decide to submit student created or work that was not presented publicly, we do encourage you to use the work sample context section, which we'll talk about in a little bit to explain why you have chosen older and or student created and or non-publicly presented work, again, if this applies to you. All applicants also have the option to submit a third work in progress work sample, and this must be a work in progress that you intend to continue to develop after the application deadline and or during the fellowship period. One additional note here while we're talking about the required work samples is that the work sample requirement and the eligibility requirements are different. Applicants must demonstrate two or more completed and presented works on their CV to meet eligibility. However, applicants do not have to represent these specific works in their work samples. And this is because as Eleanor described, we want applicants to present their strongest work um, so you have the option to share any two completed works or bodies of work in your work sample with the one distinction that I named. Um, and I will hand it back over to Eleanor to give some more work sample details. Great, thanks, Melissa. So we will also ask you for some more specific information about your work samples to help panelists understand and have kind of a fuller context about what they're seeing. So you'll notice that we ask for links or uploads for the full length works. And uh, we ask you to identify cue points within the full work versus an edited clip that's edited down to the, the length that we are requesting. And why do we do this? We do this because panelists have told us that it's really helpful to have the ability to answer questions. Uh, and if they have, uh, access to the full work, they can scan backwards or forwards from the, the clip that you've provided and find all kinds of information that they're, they're curious about as they're trying to understand how you work. When submitting full length works, uh, we ask you to identify a cue point or a page range. Uh, and this directs the panel's attention to the single sequence that you want to, them to look at um or listen to or see um and we ask you to only provide one cue sequence per work not multiple short sequences within a sample if you don't provide a cue point or a page range uh the panelists will start at the beginning and and watch for five minutes of video or audio or or 10 pages of of uh text cue points do not need to be equal for each work for example, you might indicate six minutes for your first work sample, four minutes for your second, or 13 pages for one work sample and seven pages for another. For all samples, we ask you to upload them in the order that you wish them to be viewed. And in addition, we'll ask you for a work sample description. And this gives the details about the work you're sharing, including the title, the year completed or presented, location, uh, the name of the presenting, publishing, uh, exhibiting, screening organization or venue, or if you self-produced, uh, you can let us know that. The length and scale of the work in terms of minutes, pages, or dimensions, uh, materials, medium, whether it's a solo or a group exhibition or a short or a full-length work, those kind of details go there. Uh, we will also ask you about your role in the work sample, uh, noting your generative role, as well as any other roles that you played in the work. For example, 
you might have choreographed it, you might also be performing in the work, or you might have composed it and you're um, uh, uh, playing in the work. Uh, director, designer, uh, you might be the author and the editor, um, the playwright and an actor. So let us know those details in that role field. And then we'll ask about work sample context. And this is a really important field that we encourage you to spend some time on. This is your opportunity to give the panelists context as they experience an excerpt of your work. And this can include a brief description of the whole work, uh, imp any important information about the sections of the work occurring either right before or right after a time-based clip or a text sequence, or uh, information about the whole of an exhibition, uh, your intentions and goals in creating the work. Um, this is a good place if your work is challenging to understand and comprehend in a short clip. If you're doing durational work, uh, this is a, a place where you can give more information about that. You can also uh, draw the panelists attention to specific elements of your work. Um, especially if you're um, submitting work that hasn't been presented or is self presented uh, work that um, is older than five years or um, that you are you created while you're in a degree program here is where you can share your kind of rationale for including this work sample okay laura take it away in terms of the required samples so applicants will submit the required two work samples and the third optional work sample in progress in the form of text video audio, images, or some combination of these formats, depending on your selected field. You'll see a chart here with work sample format options by field. Details for each type of submission can be found in both the application guideline PDF and in submittable. We're also holding a work sample specific info session next month. If this is an area where you'd like to learn more. I also wanted to add um, anecdotally here that I've uh, been telling applicants, you know, sometimes it's a good idea if you're torn about which field to apply in, um, you know, after going through the eligibility quiz to see the requested work samples under the field. And, you know, if you kind of note, oh, I don't really have the work samples that would seem to, you know, best fit in with combined artistic fields well then you might consider that might not be the strongest case then for submitting in that category um okay so i'll pass it over to melissa who will say a bit more about our upcoming work sample session yes thanks lara so this is our last work sample slide <laughs> before we move on to the next component of the application so this session this info session will take a deep dive into selecting your work samples for this and other similar grant programs we will review some best practices tips from past panelists and there will also be a lot of time to answer your questions um, however please note that we will not be reviewing individual work samples for that upcoming session also, if you can't make the live session, it will be recorded and posted to our website at jeromefoundation.org backslash events. And now we will move on to the next component of the application, CVs with Laura. Uh, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the questions in the chat, which we'll turn to after going through the slides. So thank you for those. Okay, so in addition to work samples, uh, we also request CVs. Um, review panels consider applicant CVs and before passing the applicant applications on to discipline specific review panels, uh, the program staff pre-screens the CVs in order to determine eligibility. So we want to make sure that you know to include on your CVs um, some key items. Any completed degrees plus enrollment and graduation dates were applicable. Note, you don't need a, any degree to be eligible for this fellowship, but if you do have any degrees, indicate the start and end dates. 
Any professional credits, including year and the venue for presentations or publications where applicable. Um, please include on your CVs your specific role as a generator of those works or director or speaking to that, you know, main creative um, force. And also indicate any grants, prizes, fellowships, awards, residencies, commissions that you might have received to date. We request applicants do not send abbreviated or abridged CVs that reflect only their most recent accomplishments. And we also want to remind you there's no minimum or maximum page limit in place for the CV requirement. So in order to determine eligibility, program staff also review CVs to verify that an artist has shown or presented um, yeah, shown or presented at least two completed works outside of a um, degree granting program. Both of these works must have been produced, commissioned, or presented by an outside organization, such as a publisher, curator, editor, and so on, and not self-produced or self-published, such as on a social media channel like TikTok, Instagram, or a personal website. So just to, again, reiterate what Melissa had said earlier, um, we want to remind you that the work sample requirement and the eligibility requirements are different. Applicants must demonstrate two or more completed and presented works on their CV to meet eligibility. However, applicants do not have to represent these specific works in their work sample. Because we want applicants to present their strongest work, you have the option to share any two completed works or bodies of work in your work sample with the one distinction that only one of these works can be made during a degree granting program, if that's applicable to you. A few final notes here. Program staff also review CVs to ensure applicants are within two to 10 years of practice. We also request that collaborators upload individual CVs for all artists applying or named in the application. Um, if program staff are unable to confirm your eligibility due to questions around your CV, then the rest of your application will no longer be considered or forwarded to the appropriate review panels. All that said, we strongly encourage you to consider attending a special CV session um, March 3rd. During this session, program staff will review best practices for creating a CV that represents and organizes your accomplishments, and we'll also take some questions. Note that we won't be reviewing individual CVs in this session, um, but if you cannot attend the live, uh, the recording will be posted to our website at jeromefoundation.org slash events. Now I'll hand it back over to Melissa to speak a bit more broadly about uh, the core questions and the forms uh, form in which we receive them. Thanks, Lara. So yeah, we're moving into a, a new section of the application. There are three core questions as a central component of the application. And Lara will go over these questions in much more detail in a moment. And now I'm going to give an overview of your options for your responses. You can choose to respond to the core questions via either text or video. And we urge you to use the format where you feel you can make the strongest and most, most authentic case for your application. Um, it's important to know that the core questions are the same, whether you're responding by text or by video and the limits on word counts and times are intended to give all applicants equivalent space to respond. If you choose text responses, they have a recommended maximum length of 500 words. We suggest that you write your responses in a word processing program like Google Docs or Microsoft Word, specifically to check the word count there and then paste your text into the submittable form. If you choose video responses, they have a recommended maximum length of four minutes, and we recommend that you speak directly to the camera. This is not an opportunity to provide voiceovers to additional work samples or to expand the panel's exposure to other works beyond the work samples. The best way to submit a video is to use your webcam or your phone to take a simple video and then upload that file to submittable. 
You can also note that the panel is not required to read or view beyond the suggested maximum lengths. So we do strongly urge you not to exceed those maximums. We also ask you to consider and address all of the details and prompts in a given question. So here you will see a screenshot of a core question that's highlighted in yellow. And below that in the pink box in gray text are more prompts and details that we'll ask you to consider and address. For additional support in determining your word counts, adjusting privacy settings for video and audio samples, or creating and uploading a video to Submittable, you can visit jeromefoundation.org backslash work dash samples. And Andrea is going to share that link in the chat as well. Um, I will pass it back to Lara to talk more about the core questions. The core questions are designed to help the panelists understand who you are as an artist, the context for your work, your creative aspirations and explorations, and who and what you are engaging or impacting through your work. In the overview document, you'll find a section on page 22 called Review Process and Criteria. So we strongly encourage you to read this prior to completing the application. The first core question is, what are you trying to accomplish as an artist and what is your artistic lineage? And you'll see there are five additional questions listed that direct you to the specific information we're looking for here. The answer to this question should illuminate your work samples and will assist panelists in assessing the artistic merit of your work. The question is not a request to sum summarize your CV or what you want to do with the fellowship or talk about why you became an artist. Your response is intended to help the panel understand your practice and its context. So please make sure you answer this question thoroughly. The second question is, what are you most proud of in your work? What are your strengths? What are the areas you wish to devote more time and attention to move your work forward? What are the most important questions you hope to explore through or about your work during a fellowship period? What makes this an especially opportune time for a two-year fellowship? These questions will be used by the panel to assess your creative explorations and aspirations. Panelists will be asked to honor the creative decisions and aspirations that artists define for themselves. The third question is who are the specific social or artistic communities, participants, participants and audiences you seek to engage or inspire and impact through your work? And how do you see your work impacting your fields? This question is inspired by the foundation's value around humility because the fellowship supports artists who embrace their roles as part of a larger community of artists and citizens and consciously work with a sense of purpose, aesthetic, social, or both. An applicant's response to this question helps the panel understand how they as an artist and their work embodies this value. A few final additional questions here. Um, note that these are optional. Um, this last optional question, is there anything else you want the panel to know and understand about your work other than need? All artists need time, money, resources, and validation that a fellowship offers. Panels disregard need-based answers to this question. Um, I think it would be more relevant here if you are shift, if you include, um, you know, whether you're shifting the way you are working, your practice, your aesthetics, or fields in ways that are not represented in your work samples, or if you wish to provide additional information about your career stage eligibility, then this space in the application would be the moment to do it. Also in this section, collaborator applicants are required to describe the roles of each of the collaborators in the creative process and how describe how the collaboration is structured. So for example, addressing, does each collaborator wear multiple hats or change roles depending on the project? These additional questions are text response only with a maximum length of 200 words. I'll pass it to Eleanor who will describe the final parts of the application, including demographic and contact information. Yes, uh, so Jerome Foundation, we seek to be inclusive and accessible to all individuals and to serve a diverse range of artists. And for this reason, we ask for information about your identity to help us know whether this program 
is achieving its objectives. We first, we invite you first to share the words that you use more fully to communicate who you are and, and your experiences. And this is your opportunity to center those parts of your identity that you find most powerful and salient and, and perhaps uh, central to your creative practice uh, and goes beyond what the more standardized checkboxes uh, provide. That said, we also participate in larger regional and national research efforts uh, that use the more standard checkboxes. So we'll ask you to complete the checkbox check, check questions around race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, and age. And we'll also ask for your contact information in case we need to reach out to you during the review process. Uh, for example, if you're, you have a link to a work sample and it doesn't function, we'll contact you uh, to, to uh, get that fixed in, rather than disqualifying your application. Andrea, over to you. Yeah, so I'm just gonna quickly go through the application and review sort of timeline and process here. Mm -hmm. So as you probably know, the applications are open. Um, and in addition to this info session, we're gonna have those additional uh, CV and work sample info sessions. We're gonna have a couple of Q&A sessions. And then also we'll be conducting the individual eligibility phone calls between now and April 15th. And applications close on Wednesday, May 4th at 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern time. And that is on the dot and late applications are not accepted. Between May and August, applications will be reviewed to confirm eligibility and panelists will determine the finalists. Panelists will meet and make their recommendations to the Jerome board from September to November. And all applicants will be notified whether they are a finalist no later than November 30th of 2022. Jerome's board will approve the fellows and all finalists will be notified of their application status no later than January 31st of 2023. As Andrea just noted, we have additional info sessions coming up on best practices for your CVs and work samples, as well as live Q&A sessions closer to the deadline. For more information on how to attend information and Q&A sessions, you can go to jeromefoundation.org slash events. Also recorded info sessions, including this session and the upcoming CV and work sample workshops will be captioned and posted to that same events page after they take place. Please note that the live Q&A sessions will not be recorded or posted. Okay. So remember now the application deadline is Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. And that's 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. I think a lot of the submittable deadlines are usually at midnight and we wanna make sure you hear this. We're not midnight, we're 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. And the reason for that is because we will have staff available on that day of the deadline to help with any problems or questions. If it's midnight, we wouldn't be there, um, but we are here for you for that deadline at 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern on May 4th. And I'm emphasizing this because late applications are not accepted and incomplete applications will not be considered. And this means in order for your application to be considered, you must click that submit button ahead of the deadline. Uh, and not at midnight. <laughs> so uh, once your application is submitted, uh, they may not, it may not be edited or updated. In order to troubleshoot any potential issues that may come up, please try to submit your application in advance of the deadline. Otherwise, you may run out of time. And please note that there's a save draft button so you can work on your application save your draft and come back to it later in advance of the deadline. And if you're having any technical issues, you can contact Submittable using the link at the bottom of the, your browser um, in, the, in the platform, or you can contact Andrea Brown, who is an incredible problem solver in anything technical. 
And just before we go on, I'm going to drop another link in the chat. Um, if you've never worked with anything with Submittable before and you're kind of wanting to get your bearings there, I just posted a link that's a good sort of introduction to what Submittable is, how it works, and how you'll first set up your account. Great. So I will um, just leave a last note here before we get into your questions, which again, I see in the chat and you can continue adding. I wanna let you know how you can reach us after today's session. If you have questions about eligibility or general questions about the fellowship, um, please make a phone call appointment with program staff. You can also send your questions by email and you can find our email addresses listed in the fellowship overview document. Um, again, if you have technical questions with Submittable, um, you would want to contact Andrea, who again, her email is included also in the fellowship overview. Yeah, so we do have some questions and just, uh, just a reminder to ask your question, click on that chat button and we'll start to kind of work our way through. So I know that there are a number of questions kind of related to uh, work samples. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of start on that front. Um, given that this is a fellowship for early career artists and we've been living with COVID-19 related conditions, has a foundation put in place a training for panelists that makes them aware of the reality that samples of theater or maybe other live performances, maybe in the form of virtual performances rather than you know, staged in a theater? Um, and will those panelists be prepared to review the merit of those samples kind of on the same level as samples of work that's been produced in a physical space, physical theater? Absolutely, um, the panel will be prepared. Uh, who we have as panelists are artists and arts leaders for uh, various arts organizations, uh, people who have a deep connection to uh, artists of all career stages, but especially early career artists. And they, like you, will understand in a very personal way the impact that COVID has had on the field. And so uh, you, 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 it's a, you'll be reviewed by, by peers in, in many ways. And I'm gonna drop a link in the chat as well. It's a list of you know, past panelists that have served on different Jerome Foundation programs. So you can get a sense of, of who those folks are. Um, of course, we have new panelists you know, every round, but this will give you a, a sense of the, the types of panelists that, that might be reviewing your work. Another question about work samples um, towards literature. Does an op-ed essay, uh, which is an opinion piece, um, would that qualify as a work sample? This is coming from the perspective, not of a journalist, um, but more a victim, witness, and survivor sharing my story via this op-ed essay. Uh, I will jump in and then I'll invite my colleagues uh, to jump in as well. Um, so I think that what's important here is the intentionality. So if you're a, a writer and uh, you're writing uh, creative nonfiction uh, and including your story, um, and that was the intention behind writing this piece, then that would be an example, that would be a sample of your creative work. If you were uh, writing a, an op-ed piece and um, you, you don't have any other kind of work in this kind of sphere to underscore that you're working in the kind of creative nonfiction arena, then um, I think the, the, the panel is looking to evaluate your creative work. So that's what you want to focus on. Um, if it's if it's only an op-ed piece, um, or not only, but if it's an op-ed piece and you don't have other creative work, then that would not be a, a good sample or an eligible sample. Laura, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would agree with everything Eleanor has said here. And I would chime in if there's, um, you know, this would be a case in which it might be 
great to book an eligibility phone call or just general program call if you want to you know look at your cv together just to kind of get a sense of um you know how does your how is your practice being communicated through the cv um and um the kind of credits that you're including because yes i think you know an op-ed could be read as um, less journalism and more creative nonfiction, but it kind of depends on the context of your practice of what are you working towards and what have you um, accomplished so far. And regardless of whether this is an eligible sample or not, I think it, you know, thank you for sharing that you're a survivor of gun violence and um, sharing your story, that's powerful. I've got a question here, maybe um, clarifying the visual arts samples, because um, there's there's some language about like two work samples and then the, the third being optional, but how does that work in visual arts when it's more image-based work samples? Do you want, I can, I can try to answer this, but Andrea and Eleanor, please chime in. Um, for visual artists, there's a, there's a total of 10 images possible uh, covering the two required work samples. And again, um, I think in the visual arts, it can be easier to think about the work samples in terms of bodies of work and also to think in terms of um, maybe an at, including work from at least two bodies of work. So visual artists work in such expansive ways that um, if you're submitting images, this is really, you know, intended to give you an opportunity to, you know, all the images obviously should be different from one another and should come from at least two completed bodies of work. And then for the third optional work in progress work sample, you have the option to upload five additional images. And those images should come from a single work or body of work. And again, should demonstrate work in progress that you intend to complete after the application deadline and or during the fellowship period. So Andrea, Eleanor, correct me if I have. All good. Yeah, and I would just um, kind of follow up on that because uh, we've got a great, attendee who's who's providing some live reaction here so you can kind of keep this thread going could a body of work be works in the same exhibition um, as how they kind of conceptually relate to each other yes and i would say you know for visual artists definitely a body of work can be self-defined we also understand that artists work in different ways and sometimes artists are working on multiple bodies of work at the same time um you know maybe in particular in the visual arts and so yes absolutely it can be work from one exhibition but it can also be work you know that that to you represents a body of work um, that might have uh, appeared in multiple exhibitions or in multiple contexts and definitely encourage you strongly to use the work sample context and description text areas in order to tell panelists, give the panelists all the context that you would want to provide about the works that you are choosing to show. A question here, uh, more specific to film video, for the third optional uh, work in progress sample, if the artist doesn't yet have footage, can they submit a lookbook or a script in lieu of a video work sample there? Um, the panel preference is going to be for uh, a video. Um, I think, you know, panelists have a hard time sometimes grasping uh, the lookbook or the script, but Andrea, do we allow for that option? We, don't have we actually the, only allow for yeah. for video if you have it, and that's kind of based on right exactly what we've heard from yeah. panelists before. That sometimes a lookbook can help in addition to some some existing footage, but itself on its own uh, sometimes can be more confusing than illuminating. Uh, another question uh, for literature: If you're working on a book, does a completed chapter count as a completed work? For the work sample or must the entire book be completed? For the eligibility requirement you have to have two completed uh, 
works. It doesn't have to be a book. It could be a short story. It could be an essay. It could be a poem. It could, you know, but um, for, for that, it has to be completed. Uh, for the work sample, uh, you can upload a chapter as your work in progress. Another uh, work sample this time in, I believe, music. Um, I have a work that I composed based off of an improv that I did with a co-musician. I do have all the rights, but now I'm wondering if it's not eligible as a generative work because of this. Composing out of improv is a substantial component of my practice, usually alone, but at times with others. The um, tricky thing for panels with uh, improvised work where there's multiple performers uh, is understanding what your creative uh, role is within that. So you'd wanna focus on the improvised samples that are uh, just performed by you uh, versus something that is uh, performed by another uh, musician. And I think just to clarify, it's, it's not improvised, but it's composed based upon an improvisation. I don't know if that changes. Um, and this might be a case of. I think this would be a good <laughs> eligibility call because um, there's so much nuance there. Um, and I wouldn't want to lead you astray. And uh, I would just reiterate, Laura, there that, you know, anyone with specific work sample eligibility questions, definitely go ahead and schedule the eligibility or program call with Jerome program staff. I'm going to drop that link in the chat too. Next. I see um, there's another question here. Um, if we were awarded something but did not accept it, should that be listed on a CV? My answer to that would be yes, maybe indicate in brackets declined. What do others think? I think that would be clarifying, um, especially if you know, it might have been announced as awarded and, you know, you just never know what information is going to be out there. So the clearer you can be in setting the record <laughs> correctly would be helpful. And then when it comes to uh, like the core questions um, and maybe even the work sample context, do you prefer a continuous narrative or would bulleted responses be okay as well? Um, as long as the bulleted responses are clear, um, I wouldn't say just do kind of sketch, you know, um, stream, stream of consciousness uh, answers. But if you're bullet pointing to make sure you kind of answer each of the questions that are asked, that, that's totally fine. Can you apply to a fellowship for this year? And then if you receive it, can you apply to the film, film video grant program in the future, like in 2023? Yes, uh, you can. Um, the one caveat there is that you can't use, we, we call it, you can't be double funded um, for the same cost. So if you're, whatever you're working on in your fellowship and whatever those costs are that you include in your plan and budget, you can't also include those in the production grant uh, when you're applying for that. Just making a note of time. I know we have a few more questions to get through. So thanks everybody. Um, another question, what if you're a first time filmmaker and you don't have a completed film, but you have a full script and work samples would consist of like scene selects, would that be enough? No, um, you'll, we encourage you to come, come back and apply uh, once you have at least two completed uh, film works, short or long. Uh, we don't, it's not a requirement to have a feature. Uh, back to literature. If you're giving a TED talk that's recorded and it supports your creative nonfiction work, 
would this count as a work sample? I would say no. Um, you can indicate that a TED talk, um, like you can indicate that that's a credit on your CV and something you've accomplished. Um, but yeah, for the literature categories, the panelists are reviewing text. Um, in the case of poetry, that's an instance where panelists are reviewing text, but there is an option for poets to upload videos um, or rather links to videos of them reading the work that's included in the work sample part of the application. Again, all of the work samples have to be your creative work. So it's your writing, if you're applying in literature, um, whether that's prose or poetry or your choreographic work, if you're applying a dance, et cetera. It has to be your creative work, not work about you or um, interviews or, th or things like that. And the last question I see in here, so get yours, get yours in soon if you still have them. This is regarding eligibility and someone who has a significant gap in their career, um, you know, missing three years here and missing four years there. Uh, does the eligibility requirement of that two to 10 years account for gaps like that? I would encourage you to um, do an eligibility call. Um, we do uh, consider gaps and it, it would be best for you to make an appointment and kind of walk through that with, with one of us. And I believe that takes us to the end of the questions that were in the queue. So just a heads up that, um, again, we'll fully caption this recording and post it to our events page. Um, it can take a couple of days to get that up, but you should look for it shortly. And we've got one more question. Uh, if you've written and performed the song that is showed under your name, but the recording of it is co-produced or co-written, would that be accepted as a work sample in music? Uh, I, this would, this might take a little untangling too. So I would suggest an eligibility call um because uh <clears throat> yeah just please call us <laughs> yeah and and I'll just, oh i would just reiterate them again any you know any work samples that have kind of nuances like that around collaborators or any questions that kind of fall outside what's explicitly described in any of the work sample format options or content or context options to go ahead and take advantage of those eligibility calls and one question on the CV, um, if someone took a continuing ed course just to brush up on some technical skills, so it wasn't a degree granting program, um, but that continuing ed course happened like the same year that one of the work samples was produced, um, is that too confusing or should somebody leave it off their CV that they took that continuing ed course? Does that affect the eligibility of the work sample at all? Uh, if we only have a concern if you're enrolled in a degree granting program. So, uh, you know, a BA, BFA, MA, MFA, PhD. Um, just taking a course uh, does not um, is not a problem in terms of kind of aligning with the timing of your your work being produced. So you can keep it on the CV with with no concern. And the last question for now, um, if my work is politically or ethnically sensitive, can I discuss the nature of my work during my, my call of program staff to maybe get some advice about the way that I can go about describing it? Yes, we, we tend to, we will advise you about, um, you know, approaches. Um, we don't really review like your specific, you know, way, and we don't critique, but we're happy to advise. And that was the last question. All right. Da, da, da. Yeah. 
Thank, thank you, you all for joining. Yes, thank you. And please uh, join us for the, the other uh, workshops uh, or tune into the recordings if you can. We really appreciate your showing up. Thank you.